Hey y'all, Uncle Jimmy here. When you speak for yourself, you're forced to think for yourself. And when you think for yourself, the sports world looks different. In order to enjoy this podcast and this show, you need to have the courage to look at the world from alternative points of view and not be offended when you disagree. Speak for Yourself isn't your Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram feed. SFY tells you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. So, welcome aboard, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. We have to start today with the awful news out of Los Angeles and the tragic death of Kobe Bryant. The entire world was stunned to learn of the Lakers legend's passing yesterday at the age of 41 as he and eight others, including his 13-year-old daughter Gianna, died in a helicopter crash. Kobe was obviously one of the all-time greats in the NBA, and since retiring, he's had an incredible second act as a family man, filmmaker, and ambassador for the game of basketball. We normally start this show uh, with a monologue, but we're not going to today. We're gonna speak from the heart initially about our reactions to this death. And Marcellus, I just gotta share with you, uh, <clears throat> the Kobe death has hit me so much harder than I anticipated. And it all relates to how he passed. In partnership with his daughter, taking his daughter to a basketball game. Marcel, at the, I don't have my own family. I'm single, I don't have kids, but I am a family man. The reason I wanted to do this show with you is because of the family you built. And in partnership, I want to be in partner with someone committed to a family, a great family, and see Kobe go down this way. It tears me up, man. Mm. Everything I believe is about family. Darnell being a little brother on this show, Uncle Jimmy, Jimmy Jackson's relationship with his kids, TJ's relationship with his daughter. We're trying to build a family show that talks sports and this has torn me up. And I feel your pain, brother. Um, you talked about how Kobe passed, and what cut me deepest was when he passed, as you said, in his second act. As you play ball, you play sports, you don't pick up that ball in thought, in mindset, that it would end this prematurely. Kobe Bryant, his greatness, allowed him to get to a place where we picked him as a kid and threw him into Los Angeles. <laughs> and he was innocent. In that moment, his innocence and his greatness is all we got to embrace from hello. And we saw him go through growing pains. He became like our family. I'm a Los Angeles native. Kobe became like a brother from another because of his growth and watching him through the highs and the lows to finally get to a place where he could fully mature and fully blossom and realize all of that he went through was now gonna be materialized in his second act as a family man. The father in me is so defeated because when you pick up that ball as a means to an end playing sports, you're thinking about what it's gonna to bring to you and your family. That dedication is not self-serving, it's for everyone. And then to think that you have another opportunity to show your greatness in the grandest of ways as a father, as a husband. And for that, not to be able to play four quarters in the game of life is what's most disturbing. For, for me, it, it, hits, it hits hard because Obviously, I play football. Kobe played basketball, so his daughter is able to follow him in that. In that. When I was playing football, I, I had two kids at the time. And so I retired. My daughter, they, they decide they want to play softball. I watch them play, and then I become their coach. Different than a the sport, I, they can't play football, so they play so Me and my daughter, Kennedy, I'm, for the last seven years, we five o'clock in the morning, we got to go to the field. We fly into Florida, we fly to Colorado, we fly to so many different states just to play softball. We get up every morning. My wife is like, that's your twin. Yeah. She walks like me, she talks yeah. like, because we're together so much. When this happened, we're at the airport getting ready to fly to Miami. She's the one text me the headline and was like, this is us. Like, we're always together. And I didn't know Kobe. I lived in the same development as him. And I would see him at pavilions. I'm like, I'm never gonna approach him because I didn't know how he would react. 
in his second act, as you said, she retires and it was like he became human. It was like he wasn't like a superhero. He was one of us. He opened up. People, the stars of the stars reached out to Kobe for advice. And I think that's why he's revered so much is because of the way in his retirement that he gave what he had to players coming up. The best players in every sport reached out to Kobe like, yes. it's disbelief. I'm not an emotional person. I don't show emotion. And I'm texting my wife and kids like, we take for granted when we leave the house that I'll see you later. And I got to stop doing that. Mm. I'm torn up about it because I'm a Laker fan. And so I love the Lakers. I love Kobe Bryant. I love everything about the Lakers. And for this to happen, you got a mother who lost a husband and a child. And then you have siblings that have lost a sister and a father. And being a parent, it's, it's, it's almost hard to fathom. It's It's... At 49 years old, you think you kind of lived through and been through a lot, but yet and still, life throws the curveballs at you that make you understand what reality is all about. And when you live, life is unfair. I don't care what we do, who you are. Life is not fair because too many times people are taken away from us too soon for whatever reason it may be, whether that's an illness, an accidental death or whatever. And it makes you realize your immortality itself. And as I get gotten older and I've, talking to, I've spoken to my son about what life really is, what's really important, we get so caught up into a lot of different things and what we do as professionals, whether it's our past careers, our current careers, and we tend to lose sight of the little things. I, I was blessed to know Kobe at 18 when he first got to LA. Like when we was at Jerry's Deli in the, in the Marina Del Rey. <laughs> yes. Just talking little things, okay? and then to compete with him through the years. So I've been on 12 teams, played a lot of places, but that journey of 12 teams took me to my 12th team, which was the Lakers, my last year, to be able to spend time and learn, like I said, the man behind the jersey, Kobe Bryant, because he has this aura, this, this mystique about him, okay, off the court. And why he catered towards me, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm not on his level, but, we formed a relationship. We had a chance to talk a lot. And I got to know him as a human being, as a person. So when this thing hit yesterday, like everybody, it was disbelief. It was, and I was up all night. I couldn't, I couldn't fathom. And not just because it's Kobe, it's because of it's his daughter. It's the seven other people that were there that families got affected because of this. It was a tragic moment for the NBA, but for life and for people in general. And to know somebody like that deeply killed me. And I look back at, and I was on the FaceTime with my little one twice. My son is over in C's playing. We text each other, talk to my mother. It shouldn't have to take a death like this for us to do that, but in life it does. And it's unfortunate. My relationship with Kobe in any way beyond a reporter, in 2014, Kobe said some things about Trayvon Martin that didn't sit right with me, and I criticized him. And the next thing I know, Kobe was texting me, and it started a conversation between us over the next couple of months. And the entire conversation in 2014 was about his vision for what he wanted to do for young people. And so last week, and I'm a longtime critic of Kobe, everybody knows that, but last week something was in my heart like, Man, that, what Kobe was telling me in 2014, he's actually doing mm. in his post career. And it hit me last week, like, I love what this dude represents. And so we talked about it on this show, about him being a role model. And he said some things that we all thought were a little goofy about mm. WNBA players. But I interpreted that this dude loves his daughter so much, you're going to say goofy things. Mm. That, that's, yep. that's a representation of his love. And so... For two or three days later, for this to happen, when I just was really having an appreciation for Kobe and I was like, can't wait to see what he does in this next chapter for him to be gone. It just feels like a great loss. For, I, I hate to frame it this way because Kobe was bigger than just being about race. But just for black people, I feel like it's a loss, man, losing this dude. Yeah, and it doesn't add up. And I think that's what really disturbs me. Because we all have 
the currency of the three T's, uh, time, talent, treasure. All of us possess that. And for him to be so great at basketball and that talent, to get all of those treasures, to lose the time with his family, the time going forward, that expectation of see you later will never be realized. Think about it. Who wouldn't borrow from their talent and treasure to give themselves more time? The ultimate currency. Kobe lost that. And that's what's so, so disturbing is because I'm not lying. I only play sports to help all of my family. I only threw that ball up in the air and watched them popcorn ceiling rocks hit me in the face from age seven all the way through. Pain, surgery, pain, surgery. Because I knew it was going to enhance my experience and my family's dynamic. And I did it because I wanted to pay it forward. And now, I'm a father of four kids. And then you lose everything you worked for. You didn't work for it for accolade and work for it just to get the check and just so other people could revere you and just so you could get buckets. You did it because that was going to be able to materialize into a greater existence. And now he can't even be a part of that. The biggest reason it also hits home, and it's not just us, it's everybody that has kids and has played sports. You want your kids to come up behind you and play sports. And if you did make it, you want them to be better than you were. Mm. And if you did make it, you want them to make it to your level and be better than you. And we've all, whether it's on an airplane or a car drive, we've all been in the car with our kids going to practice, mm. going to games. Maybe not a helicopter, but we've all traveled that road to, oh, we got to get up early in the morning and go, oh man, the weather's terrible. We still got to go. We can't miss this. Dedicated. And we've all have gone through this. And so it hits home because Everybody can relate to this when you have a child that is played. I know for me, my oldest one, she started playing. My wife's like, which one you taking? It doesn't matter. I'll take Carrington. You can take Kennedy. But then when I became Kennedy's coach, it was, I have to take her. And for me, after this, it, I'm going to, it, say, it takes something so tragic. To ch I'm going to change. I'm going to, I want my son to be able to cry. Me and Marcellus was talking about this mm -hmm. on the way here. Yeah. I don't show emotion. And when my son cries, I'm like, boy, you better shut up. No, I want him to be able, because if I can cry in front of you guys, to me, that's a bigger sign of strength. Me trying to be fake tough and not cry is a sign of weakness. And so I want to show my son that, and tragic things like this puts a lot of stuff in perspective to where I know I got to change because I'm going about doing things the wrong way, even though I know it, but it's going to force me to change some things within myself. Mm. But the beauty of it, though, when you talked about changing, the, those life experiences allow you to grow. OK, when we talk about Kobe Bryant, the, th the things that he wrote about, OK, in his animation were experiences that happened in his life that allowed him to be pure, genuine and heartfelt. He changed as a man, as a father, as a husband, because of all the steps and things that he went through throughout his career. Yeah, he was hard and he was flawed, but he accepted those flaws. He was who he was. But those same flaws allowed him to appreciate that his family, his wife a lot more. And <clears throat> I want to pick up on something Marcella said. I, I struggled because I can be a little rigid. <laughs> I can be a little rigid. And so when, when athletics change, and there were more guys celebrating on the field, it took me a minute to figure out like the rewards and who all can benefit from the performance yes. will take you to an emotional level that wasn't there previously. And so a lot of times, again, Marcel, when you talk about every, all these guys, regardless of where they came from, they're all out there like, they're not just doing it for them, it's for their families. And, and, and I get it. And so I, 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 for Kobe not to fully be able to experience all the rewards from, what is it, 20 years of sacrifice on the basketball years. court? Professionally. And, 20 yeah, years. 20 years. Huh. And so now you get to shower that on his family, and then he was trying to shower it on other kids as well. 
and he doesn't get to, that's what it was all about them 20 years. Yeah. It's to shower it on a bunch of other people. And it's, it's, a, it's a terrible tragedy, man. And, and I think what connects all of us, whether you're an athlete or not, is sacrifice. Kobe, and I've always told him this, and every time we had such a great relationship because he respected that I didn't even have to kiss up to him. I was a Clippers fan doing <laughs> LA radio and Kobe would come on there for hours and we would just joan on each other, talk about his greatness and then he would talk to me and I would go back at him. And what I learned about him being the most committed athlete I ever saw was the fact that he sacrificed so much. And as any sacrifice goes, there's a summation that is supposed to occur that you are supposed to realize. You're not doing it for no other reason but to realize what that sacrifice means. And it feels like he was robbed of that, but what connects us is the fact that it doesn't add up. This life is not adding up. I feel so defeated because who knows if I'm able to see my son, see my daughters, see my wife. Who knows? There were moments when you talk to Kobe, you're like, He's such an icon living, such a living legend. You wanted to like, just think, let me touch him. Let me grab him. Let me get a piece of that. And now in this moment, who wants to exchange all of that to not have anything to pay for it? That's what's so sad about it. We talk about physical fitness a lot, but there's another side to the game that's just as important. I'm talking about mental fitness, calm, the number one app for sleep and meditation has teamed up with LeBron James to help you train your mind. LeBron and Calm know that your mind is like any other muscle in your body, and Calm can help you train your brain so you sleep better, have less stress, and perform at your best. For LeBron James, sleep is an important part of his mental fitness routine. He says, getting good sleep and finding time to rest is one of the most valuable things I can do for my body and mind. And if you head to calm.com slash sports 40, you'll get 40% off a calm premium membership. With calm, you have access to nature scenes LeBron loves and so much more like sleep stories and meditations. For a limited time, our listeners can join LeBron in using calm with a 40% discount to an annual membership at calm.com slash sports 40. Unlock content to help you focus, ease stress, and sleep better. Get started at calm.com slash sports40. That's calm.com slash sports40. Whitlock and Wiley, Jim Jackson is back. We're joined now by Fox Sports analyst LeVar Arrington. Let's return to Kobe Bryant, who was among nine dead in a helicopter crash in Los Angeles area yesterday, including his 13-year-old daughter, Gianna. Kobe was a legendary competitor on the court with a relentless drive to win that at times alienated some teammates, but also helped lead the Lakers to five NBA championships and cemented his status as one of the NBA's all-time greats. Listen, I I've given us a lot of thought about how Kobe should be remembered. And I think he's the smartest athlete the NBA has ever seen, and perhaps the smartest athlete we've ever seen in any of our high profile professional sports. I, I think that is his legacy, his mind. I think as an athlete, he mimicked Jordan on the court and the only thing he couldn't get exactly like Jordan was matching Jordan's athleticism. Where he surpassed Jordan, in my view, is his mental approach to the game. Kobe, the ultimate student of basketball, the ultimate student of sports, you know, I think that's his legacy. When I remember him as a basketball player, smartest guy I ever saw. Yeah, I'm gonna remember the redemption story of Kobe. I think his legacy is gonna really speak volumes to everyone out there who privately are able to live out their five lowlights behind that veil. No one can see it, but Kobe had to live it out publicly for the world to see. When you talk about greatness, that's something that not all of us can actually live through and can actually realize. 
We all haven't felt that, especially Kobe's level. But we all have felt low points. And how do you climb back out of that despair? And Kobe publicly to live through those growing pains for all of us to witness. I judge Kobe like I judge every man by the distance traveled. And Kobe's distance from his highs to his lows back to the culmination of the highs on the grandest stage, which is the game of life, not the game of basketball. This is Super Bowl week and with great pride, I wear this ring and I was given this ring by Jason of Beverly Hills who does the Super Bowl rings. He said, Marcellus, this is gonna be funny, but I'm serious as hell. You didn't win a championship. You didn't win in the game of football, but you won in the game of life. You're a father, you're a husband, and you've transitioned. And I'm telling you, Kobe was in that place of transitioning to greatness beyond the scope of a basketball court and couldn't live it through. You know, when I look at his legacy and what it means to me, he easily is the only athlete in my book that would ever be comparable to Michael Jordan. And when I think of Michael Jordan and I think of Kobe Bryant, and it's almost synonymous to me, the, 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 the phrase or the, the meaning that takes place for me is brilliance and excellence in motion. And, and that's to me the legacy that I will always take away from what Kobe Bryant was able to give to us on the basketball court was brilliance and excellence in motion. Beauty, um, from pure basketball perspective, Kobe had the unfortunate of being at the tail end of the Jordan era and then once LeBron came in. So he was caught in between. He was that bridge in between two eras. So when people looked and analyzed his career when comparing the greatest, <clears throat> excuse me, they would often leave Kobe name, Kobe's name out of it because of that, because Tim Duncan happened to be in that era as well. So you never really fully appreciated his greatness because you were too busy comparing them to Mike on the back end, mm -hmm. LeBron on the front end, and Tim Duncan in the middle, who's the best. Mm -hmm. But yet and still, what you couldn't deny or compare was what he stood for as a basketball player. The relentless pursuit of perfection, which you can't get. But what you can get in between there is the opportunity to give you and your teammates the ability to celebrate greatness in a championship form. He wanted to do that with Shaq. He wanted to do that without Shaq. It was a purpose. He was purpose driven. So when you look at the iconic basketball players and where you stand in history, it's funny, Jason, as a journalist, you cover a certain time period and certain athletes are there for you to admire, but also for you to break down and evaluate. Those are the people that you see. Who's gonna write the story 15, 20 years from now? Is it the people that covered Michael Jordan, the people that covered Kobe or LeBron? See, because that's a moving scale, okay, to where the greatness lies. But when you put his career on par and parcel with the greats, yeah, sometimes his shooting percentage wasn't as great. But what he was able to accomplish from 18 years old to the time he retired, you put that against somebody else's, okay? And what he did and what he brought to the, you're talking about iconic level. We're not talking about just in the United States. I had the fortune to travel to China and understand his impact when Yao Ming was at his height. And it was Kobe Bryant, okay? But Jim, I, I wanna say this, cause you and I are a little bit older than these guys. And, and to me, when people really start discussing the greats, they really don't discuss stats. And, and, and really they discuss persona and what they represented. And for me, I'm you, as a kid, I was a big Magic Johnson guy. Right. That was my guy. And, and Larry Bird was his rival. And the only guy I've ever seen universally talked about the way Larry Bird was talked about is Kobe. Because if you remember when we were kids, they always, Oh, Larry showed up at the gym early. And the whole insinuation was Larry worked harder Larry than everybody, everybody else. else. Yep. That's what they say about oh, Kobe. Kobe. Yeah. He's the, really the first that, because again, a lot of times when it's a black athlete, we get enamored with their athleticism. Oh my God, Magic is a six foot nine point guard. With Kobe, it's like, oh my God, he, every detail mattered, 
He worked harder than everybody else. He demanded more things from everybody else. It was the way they talked about Bird. So to me, he's comparable to Bird and Michael Jordan. That's a hell of a legacy. Wait, and, and that's why he took it to another level from Michael. I was fortunate, unfortunate not to be in the playoffs at the time, but with Ron Harper during their run in the early 90s. And I got a chance to be there with Michael Jordan, with Ron, with Scotty, to see it from my eyes, Michael's work ethic, what he demanded from his teammates. Okay, I, I can put it on me, but I need you to tag along to understand how we're going to win. That was on a whole nother level. Kobe took that to another level in regards to his preparation, long term, okay? And that's what you're talking about because if you talk to the guys that played with Kobe on the Olympic team, like LeBron and all those guys, Kobe set the standard, okay? Sit five o'clock in the morning, wake up, go work out. It was him by himself at first. LeBron tells the story. By the end, getting close to playing, everybody was up doing what Kobe did. That's what you're talking about right there. That's legendary status right there that can't be denied. And he didn't fall under the spell that is the curse of the gifted. And we yeah. all know about the curse yeah. of the gifted playing sports. Mm -hmm. With that tremendous talent, oh, maybe he skips a fundamental or two. Kobe. Kobe will walk in that gym knowing he's the best on the court and will work like he's the worst. And would outwork you for your observation, to make you work harder to be your best so I can fully realize how great I am because I beat you at your best. Damn it, that's amazing. <laughs>We are live in South Beach from Loomis Park. We're here to look ahead to Super Bowl 54, but today we're looking back at the life of Kobe Bryant. All right, welcome back to Speak For Yourself, presented by Hyundai, Whitlock and Wiley, joined once again by Jim Jackson. All right, let's return to the awful news out of Los Angeles, where Kobe Bryant and eight others, including his 13-year-old daughter, Gianna, died in a helicopter crash yesterday. Kobe's talent and drive on the court were never in doubt, but off the court, he did face some troubles. With an accusation of sexual assault surfacing against him in Colorado in 2003, the incident colored public perception of him for years, with many never viewing him the same way again. Uh, the question we're gonna ponder here is how should Colorado impact how we remember uh, Kobe Bryant? And it's easy for me to say as a man and as a hardcore sports fan, mm -hmm. and as someone whose faith and understanding of God and religion tells me, uh, judge not lest ye be judged, and tells me I like to judge people where they're at, not where they're from. I take into account where they're from, but I really try to evaluate people where they're at. And as I said last week, I love where Kobe Bryant was at. I love what he represented in this second career, post career, his commitment to women's sports, to his daughters going to UConn games, WNBA games. If that's how Kobe was paying a penance for his behavior in Colorado in 2003, more power to him, hats off. I hope everybody handles their mistakes the exact same way. So for me, and I think Marcellus, you kind of previewed your take earlier, I'm kind of right there with you, distance travel. And he set himself back and had to play catch up but I love the way he was going about it post-career and in the second half of his life. And I'm just sorry, I haven't made the mistake that Kobe was accused of, but I made some terrible mistakes mm. that weren't public. Mm. And I hope people are able to judge me on who I am right now mm -hmm. as opposed to who I was then. Yeah, uh, imagine being defined by a singular experience mm -hmm. for your entire life, potentially your legacy as well very disturbing. I'm not talking from a male perspective. I'm not gonna talk from a fan perspective. I'm gonna talk from a human perspective. That Kobe in Colorado, there's a victim. Mm -hmm. And there's also Kobe Bryant who lived out his shame, his embarrassment publicly. And to his best ability, tried to redefine not only his image, but his reality to the point where now even his harshest critics would have to interpret some of the imagery of him being a family man, being a husband, being dedicated to his family 
into the equation of who Kobe Bryant is. So, man, as I say, my five lowest, lowest points of my life, thankfully, weren't for the world's view. Mm -hmm. But imagine if they were, yeah. and imagine even more so that I was being judged solely on that. Disturbing. But humanity speaks, and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the legacy part of it. You have to include that in the storyline. It can't be a subchapter. It has to be something that we talk about so we can understand the human nature of a person and how you grow or can go the opposite side of that. And when you talk about Kobe Bryant and what made him dynamic, he was calculated. It's very easy for Kobe right after the Colorado incident to go on this campaign where now all of a sudden he's changing his demeanor. That wasn't it. He quietly changed home first, which was important. Okay, he changed home. He had to take care of that aspect of his wife and what she was going through because not only was Kobe put on the public, you know, outlets and pedestal or whatever it was, it was his wife, it was his family, okay? He had to take care of that first. So if you fast forward to what he's been doing post his basketball career, it's a byproduct of where he started from back there when he had the realization that when I mess up, especially like this, it just doesn't affect me. Right. It affects the woman that I'm married to. It affects, you know, my kids or my kids' kids. It, that's, that's the Kobe Bryant right there. And, and for me, if you look down the history at some of the iconic people, we talk about Mike Tyson with his history, whether it's Michael Jackson with his history, it's part of the storyline. And we're not women, so we don't understand what that really means to a woman. Maybe sometimes it doesn't get justice. Okay, so we can't just sweep that under the rug, but that is part of this story, and it's growth, it's growth as well. This morning, as we were preparing for the show, we were having this discussion with the staff, and one of the points I made was, there's been a woman at the Washington Post, a political writer, who tweeted out a link to the Kobe incident from back in 2003, and she has been suspended, and I disagree with that strongly. That woman has a right to have that be her point of view and perspective, even on this day. Mm -hmm. I disagree with it, I don't, but she has a right to think that, and it led to a conversation. We have a lot of people that work with us uh, behind the scenes. We have a segment producer, Tasha Vanelli, very smart, hardcore sports fan, and we were having this discussion this morning, and I wanted Tasha to be able to share her perspective, growing up a Kobe Bryant fan yeah. and going through this 20-year odyssey. Yeah, I mean, for me, I I love Kobe. You know, he came into the league, I was about eight years old. I just started playing basketball seriously, so he was quickly one of my favorite players. Um, it's, it's really hard, because when the Colorado thing happened, I was just, I was devastated, you know? I looked up to this guy and modeled my game after him. I was so angry and upset as a fan with him. And um, I didn't know if he was gonna be able to redeem himself. I really didn't. But kind of like what Jim said, you know, handling the family stuff afterwards. The way he handled his, himself after that situation, he redeemed himself for me. I forgave him. I, I saw how he was handling with his family, his daughters, what he's done for women's basketball, you know, telling these little girls you can do anything a man can do. I, I forgave him. I, I started really liking him again, I'm respecting him again. And I think honestly the saddest thing for me is I don't know another high profile male athlete that has done so much and been such a huge advocate for women in sports. And I just, I just don't know if there's gonna be anybody that can stand up and fill that void and do it authentically. Thank you for sharing that, Tasha. Really appreciate it. We needed that perspective. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want us to be yeah, a yeah. bunch of guys up talking here about yep. uh, talking about it. And again, I want to say to the people that have been beating up this woman from the Washington Post online, she has a much more strident perspective than Tasha. She has a right to feel that way. Because I certainly know sometimes we as black people, we have a point of view that people don't yeah, <laughs> agree yeah, with all the time. Right. And we have a right to feel that way. This woman has a right to feel that way about Kobe. Uh, it, it, it doesn't bother me, and she certainly shouldn't be suspended for having that opinion. And you want to know why I think Kobe's death is having such a, a devastating effect on so many people, people that never, that never touched him, that never was in his presence. Uh, I, I go back to an adage that really hits me. It says, if you want to impress me, show me your accolades. But if you want to impact me, 
show me your scars. And mm -hmm. Kobe's scars were visible for the world. And one thing my therapist tells me about shame, he said, ooh, shame, shame is undefeated. I said, what do you mean? He says, because you never get rid of all of it. Think about it. When you walk around, people will always remind you of how great you are. Go anywhere. But when you have shame, you, the inner voice, mm -hmm. that inner monologue always reminds you of that moment. Yep. So you could go into a room and people stare at you. If you don't have shame, you're thinking positive things. You have shame, you're always thinking of that low moment. Imagine forever that cinematic experience of the negative always being a part of your journey. That's tough. TurboTax is here to help this tax season by making tax filing easier for you. They've made it their mission to give you all the tools and advice you need to get your taxes done with confidence, like making uploading your W-2 as easy as taking a picture. Just use your phone or tablet to simply snap a picture of your W-2 and then watch your information appear in the right place in your tax return. You can be sure you're filing your taxes correctly while at the same time making sure you're getting the best possible refund. TurboTax, all people are tax people. Joining us now are Steelers linebacker, Devin Bush, Steelers legend, future Hall of Famer, NFL Fox Sports analyst, James Harrison, Devin, thank you for being here, guys. Yeah, thank you both for being here. Uh, first, we got to get to Devin. Could you give us an explanation of the hairstyle? Is that the Hushman Zada? <laughs> Turn it around. Defensive look? Turn or is it the, the you know, yeah. 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 All right, nothing but ultra perm. Hey, no, this is Afro shit. Nah, <laughs> nah, this is me, though. Like, uh, I had dreads before, and uh, man, like, I ain't like getting my hair done, so I was looking rough. And Mom called me, he was like, hey, look, yo, like you on TV and you looking a mess. Mm. Right? You gotta do something with it. So I'm like, you know, I'm, I had dressed like 10 years at a time. Yeah. Uh, my sophomore year of college, I'm like, you know, I'm about to, you know, think about going to, to the pros, so I might as well just start looking professional. Yeah. So I started, you know, I went to the barber, started cutting my hair off, and I uh, looked to, to my left. And I, like he had lined me up, cut it all, and he had some dreads left to cut back in the back. I was like, that look pretty cool down there. He was like, he, like, he, was, he, was, like I, I, he was like, it do look pretty cool. Mm. And I was like, you know what, just leave it. Just leave it. And uh, I left it, and That's then my plan. sister seen it, platted it up, and... Yeah. And Let then, me ask you this. Signature now. You it. walk into the Steelers building, Jack Ham, Jack Lambert, Greg Lloyd, every great NFL, uh, James, James Harrison. Harrison. Thank you. My <laughs> God. Yeah. Is there pressure to be a linebacker in Pittsburgh? Nah, it, it, a lot of people think that's pressure. It actually make it easier if you, if you think about it, you know? I mean, I'm going to a linebacker team and they're gonna focus on linebackers, so all I gotta do is do my job. Mm. That's all I gotta do. Yeah, last year, talking about doing your job, you guys really overachieved by expectations, especially because of the injuries and obviously losing Ben Roethlisberger. Yeah. Missing all but two games last year. Talk about the season emotionally from thinking you have a chance to we have to redeem ourselves with a new quarterback. It seemed like a couple times yeah. throughout the year. It was it was hard. It was a lot of emotions in there. We struck out when we was 0-4. You know, and we like, dang, where'd it, where'd it go? Like, I thought we were supposed to be winning. And uh, you go there, and then we hit a little hot streak, and we start winning. We start, you know, we even our record out 4-4. We keep playing. And uh, we hit a tank again. We lose, you know, two games back to back. And, you know, now we out of the playoffs. So it was, it was hard to, like, just stay in that, that happy medium and, and, and build off something because, you know, we was going in and out of quarterbacks and, yeah. and losing games we weren't supposed to be losing and winning the next ones and losing a couple after that. So it was it was up and down roller coaster. Yeah, that man, I, I think, uh, you know, I talked to a few of the guys through the season, and, and I, you know, I, I got a feeling from the guys that I talked to, of course, defensive guys, that you guys had more of a confidence that y'all felt like y'all could go out there as a defense, really, and just... Yeah dominate the game and if y'all had to, you know, put the offense in scoring position or score, you know, is that something that you guys felt like, you know, y'all could do and still have, you know, a successful season after you did, you know, have a few drops and, and lost Ben? Yeah, it was times in the defense room where we looking at each other and we like, yo, you know what's on us. Like, you know, if we got to win this game, we got to score or we got to set up a score. We got to take and turn the ball over. We got to do something. And we go out there and we, and we made it happen. You know, we, we didn't excel the, the turnovers that we had the year before. And we, you know, we was out there wrecking shop. 
So uh, yeah, we definitely was was just ready to make a play. You know, every every day of practice, we're like, all right, we gonna make that play. We gonna cause this fun. We gonna make this pick. Yeah. We get in the game and we need this play right now. We gonna make a play. You know, so we was super confident in that. J James, you obviously know all the history of the linebackers in Pittsburgh. Does Devin remind you of anybody from Pittsburgh's past? To, to be honest with you, he, he reminds me of, of Ferry. Mm. James Ferry. James Ferry. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, he he, he looks mm. a little light. You know, Posse was a light guy. Yeah. Posse was about 212, 215. I'm about to say 215, mm. right? 215 by the time the end of the season came, but he came with that thump. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's something that he has. He has thump. He has speed to get there and, and, and vision. So that, that's, you know, that's who he reminds me of. All right, from the outside looking in, it looked like Minka Fitzpatrick, that addition, took the defense to a whole different level. What did it look like to you? I think it was the same thing. I think he gave us that stability, you know, on, on, the, on the last level. And to be behind everything, to have a, safe, a safety blanket, you know he's going to make that tackle. You know he's going to make that pick, and he's going to be in the right, state, right place in the right time. So I think he was just another asset, you know, to our contributing to them turnovers and helping us win games. Let's go through the Miles Garrett. Mason Rudolph mm. situation. How did that land in the locker room? And since Man. the season's behind you, you can tell the truth. Man, it was. Don't tell too much now. Yeah. <laughs> Man, it, was, it, it, it was. It was. It was just so crazy, like how it just like one of those things where like did that just happen? And you in the locker room, you just looking at your teammate, you just like, dang, like we just lost, and our quarterback just got hit. In the head with a helmet, and yeah. it's all over the place. And now your your quarter, you looking at your quarterback, and through the week or the next week, he it's a whole bunch of stuff on, on the media him about him, and you just hoping he don't see it or he don't, you know, go in the tank with it. And you got to perform, you know, we got to win the game next week. You just hoping, you just hoping he just get it back all, and we we just leave it where it's at. We we got we got a mission, you know. We we trying to we trying to win. Devin, I started. Our early part of my sports writing career was in Ann Arbor. Give me some hope that Jim Harbaugh and this thing is going to get right. Yeah. Give me some hope. I'm gonna give you some. I'm, I need hope too. <laughs> <laughs> That's man, not we, what you were saying. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I gotta keep it real, but we just we just not we not winning the big games. That's all. We got we have to find a way to win the big games. And, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta do it. What do you think is, is leading to you guys not winning the big games? Is it the um, players? Is it the coaching? Is it, is it a combination of the both? Or? Man, I think it's a combination of the both. Um, I think, uh, you know, obviously I was there. I just feel like we need the right mentality. You know, we need to walk into that game and not be like, okay, I hope Ohio State don't show up this today. You know, I hope we, they give us a freebie. It's like, nah, like we gotta go in there, we gotta take it. So, so I you think, think it's uh, it may be more of a mental thing, especially for the guys that's been there, uh, you know, two, yeah. three years, and they've gone through that same thing for over sure. the course of that time. Sure. With I mean, if you look at it, I mean, everybody that came out, you know, we got a, we had a lot of players come out and go to the NFL and be good. They're still playing. You know, we have NFL talent at Michigan. It's just the mentality when you're at Michigan. You know, it's all right. Let's we got to win this game. And sometimes you're getting. You get into that that hole where it's like our right, old state is up seven of uh, seven of us on your game in the last like seven eight, seven eight years and it's like we gotta win one. You know, sometimes I think people get stuck in that little hole of more of, of a hoping to win instead yeah. of you know preparing to win exactly. and expecting to win. Exactly. Well, there's two teams preparing to win Super Bowl mm -hmm. championship this weekend. You guys faced them both Chiefs preseason, Niners regular season. What's your prediction? I'm going to San Fran. Mm. I'm going San Fran. I, I like I like Jimmy G. I like their defense a lot. Though. You said you like Patrick Mahomes. Is that what you said? <laughs> I, I like Patrick Mahomes too, that. but hey, but I the, mean, you said you love Patrick Mahomes. But Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes is one person. San Fran playing Tyree with, Hill with 22. Two. Oh, you can have yeah, Tyreek Hill. They're gonna do what they do, but at the same time, San Fran, they play like this. You know, they play you special teams defense. Interview, man. Man. You had a great day. Why are you jacking I'm up? Just, I'm just keeping it real with him. Huh? They, they, they I like feel this. like San Fran go do it too. You yeah. got a defense over there. Right, Don't let, get me, me wrong. Patrick Mahomes is going to do something. Let me in on this something. Okay. Let me in. Now that y'all got James Harrison and Antonio Brown out of the locker room, this feels like a family in Pittsburgh. <laughs> you know? I mean, now you can focus on winning. Right. Dude, we can use them for a couple plays. <laughs> yeah. Might still be playing. Right, I'm saying. <laughs> Joined once again by Jim Jackson and LeVar Arrington. Let's return to the awful news out of Los Angeles. Uh, the world was stunned yesterday to hear that Kobe Bryant and eight others, including his 13-year-old daughter, Gianna, died in a helicopter crash. 
The news hit the Lakers hard with LeBron James appearing to very emotional while leaving the team playing and Dwight Howard posting a tribute on Instagram and saying that this season would be dedicated to Kobe Bryant. All right, listen, I want to pivot here and just talk some basketball and the impact of this. I think there are some basketball implications to Kobe's death. Don't want to make light of it, but I just want to deal with the reality. Marcel, I, I honestly think the battle for LA is over. Right. I, I think that the emotion of this is going to inspire something in LeBron James. When you get to year 17, you've won three championships, you've won four or five MVPs, you've done it all. He, they've already been inspired just by Kawhi and the Clippers threat. I think playing the rest of this season for Kobe Bryant's legacy, memory, to be, to do something to honor the Mamba mentality, I think is going to give the Lakers an emotional edge the rest of this season, and the battle for L.A. is over. L.A. is all about the Lakers and LeBron James. So much to the fact, and y'all watch this show, I started out the year rooting for the Clippers, and up until Kobe passed, I'm all, I wanted the Clippers to win. I want LeBron James and the Lakers to win this championship. I want this to be LeBron's crowning achievement in the year Kobe passed, he passed him in scoring, and he led that franchise to a championship and put himself in that Lakers pantheon. I think that would be, a, as the journalist, we root for storylines. Yes. And I think this would be a tremendous storyline, and I think the emotion of this city is going to help propel the Lakers the rest of this season. I agree with you in the sense of it would be an amazing storyline, but I don't think this will inspire them, mm. and I don't think that this is going to fully translate. Um, when you talk about inspiration, being inspired, that is capturing emotions. And those emotions are now going to challenge you to be greater than yourself. But those emotions will subside. This is going to sound a little heartless, but it's coming deep from my pain in my heart. I lost my mother, uh, 2005. Now, the deepest losses you can have is the ones who gave, you gave life to and those who gave you life. Well, my mother passed. Every millisecond I thought about my mom and what it meant to me in my world and my life. Every frame of my life had my mom somehow, some way, a part of it. And then there became a distance in no seconds where there were a minute or so that I didn't think about my mom. Then it was like, oh, an hour or so I didn't think about my mom. Anyone who's been through the healing and grieving process understands that, even though you are still under the love and influence, the inspiration because of those distances between those moments where it really rips at you, starts to change how you go about your work. Everywhere you go, there you are, man. I don't think that this is gonna have that impact because I tell you this, I thought the world was gonna be affected when my mom passed. I literally thought the next day was not gonna come or at least be cloudy, rain, something. Show me universe, world, God, that you felt it as well. You know what the next day was? Waking up six in the morning, sunny blue skies, the world keeps turning. I don't think it's gonna have that inspiration on it. I gotta say, in, in this tragic cataclysmic happening, when you look at what Kobe Bryant has represented and now what he'll represent in death, I think it, it will have a tremendous motivating factor on the team. And I think one thing to, to add to what you were saying, Fans are not only going to want to see the Lakers win, this now gives LeBron any type of ills that have maybe followed LeBron, maybe, you know, part of the Lakers um, picking him up. He can use this as a uniting uh, factor, so to speak. He can take what has now happened and, and almost take the torch, take the mantle, and, and further what his legend is based off of the tragedy of maybe one of the greatest legends to, to ever don a Lakers uniform. So I think they'll not only be motivated, but they have a tremendous opportunity to open themselves up to a larger market of fans 
and actually create a, a unified front where you're saying, you know what? I was rooting against the Lakers. I wanted the Clippers to win. I wanted this team to win. But now I'm looking at what took place and it is an amazing opportunity within tragedy to turn it into a positive triumph. Yeah, and it's tougher too, because in the single moment, like when my father passed away, it's singular in regards to the effect outside of the family. Yeah. So you don't have the emotional context. Within the team structure though, because you're dealing with so much more of the dynamic of the team structure and how he affected people outside of just LA worldwide. You take what happened with New Orleans Saints with Hurricane Katrina. That was used as a motivation that, that when the emotions started to wane a little bit, you couldn't help but see what was going on outside because people were displaced. That stayed with them throughout that year. Did it carry on after that? Maybe not. But during that duration and that period of time, that emotion was able to sustain the momentum that they gained from that and ultimately won a championship. That's why I think that with this, because of where we're at in this shortened time period, that emotional context will be able to push the Lakers to a height that they didn't even know emotionally. When they don't feel like playing, when things are not going well, when they're injured, all those things going up against a tough Clipper team who maybe dynamically may be built a little bit different, that emotional mindset could inspire this te team to do some things that we didn't think were, were possible. I think LeBron James, and I mean this in every way possible, positive, is a guy that loves to tap into his emotions, loves to use emotion to uh, galvanize a team and push a team forward. And I think uh, LeBron is someone who authentically cares about people. Yeah. And so I think that the pain of Kobe's death and thinking about his own family, his own kids, and like, damn, Kobe's... I think he's going to authentically and positively embrace this opportunity to honor Kobe Bryant. And go look at what LeBron said after passing Kobe Bryant. He's like, man, oh, yeah. the stars are aligned. It's here in Philly. Mm -hmm. And blah. he connected all those dots. And now I think he's going to connect the dot. Like, I have an opportunity to put a bigger spotlight on Mamba mentality. And if you, all season, and it may have started out as just a way to be counter Kawhi, but it's turned into something real about load management. Mm -hmm. And so he was already in that lane of Mamba mentality, every game, every... And it may have been just to juxtapose, contradict Kawhi Leonard, but it was real. And I just think they're going to lean further into that. And I'll say this about parental death or death of a loved one. When it's in a team environment, like Jim said, it's the whole team, but it's also when it's in a city environment. This city, Los Angeles, we're down here in Miami, but we know what's going on mm -hmm. in LA. This city's on fire for Kobe. <laughs> Everywhere these Lakers players go, they're gonna hear from Fe Kobe, man. We gotta do it for Kobe, we gotta do it for Kobe. It's like being at Penn State whenever we are, yeah, right. and we gotta do yeah, it for X, Y, and Z. Things that galvanize, I'm sure teams at Ohio mm -hmm. State and mm -hmm. any team. I think it's going to have a very positive impact. I think it's going to give Frank Vogel, Rob Palinka, Jeannie Buss a very easy message. Hey, everybody from the people selling peanuts to the people selling tickets. Hey man, are we meeting Kobe standard? Are we meet, are we playing? Are we doing our job with a Mamba mentality? That message is gonna resonate the rest of the year. Yeah, but there's still what you just said there, and not to be the cynic, but yeah, no, please. The, the love of Kobe will allow you to create a story that will change your perception and make you conflate coincidence for correlation. It could be of coincidence the Lakers win a championship this year. They were gonna win it whether Kobe passes or not. But we will say now there's a correlation, there is a direct effect because of our story that we're going to apply and map onto this team because of this situation. So as the coach in me would say, unless you were given less, how can you give more? So everyone goes around with the proverbial 110%. I'm not a believer. I am not a believer. You, if you guys were fully motivated before, then you can't, but, but if you weren't, now, who is that on the team that can have impact? Who, is it LeBron? Is it AD? 
not to my standard, not to my eyes. They look fully motivated and engaged. That's why they're the best team right now in the NBA by record. I so. think you both make great points, but to add to what Whit was saying, I think Kobe Bryant has the persona even in death, maybe more so in death, to become transcend being a, a human. It now turns into a symbol. I think when you're talking about Mamba mentality, it was already becoming a symbol mm -hmm. while he was here, mm -hmm. right? Mamba mentality, I mean, everybody's talking about the Mamba Academy, Mamba this, Mamba that. Now, you're talking about something, we're talking about the season? No, this may become something that is a part of the fabric of what the Lakers organization is. It could become a part of the fabric of what basketball represents moving forward because it becomes symbolic. It's not about it being remembrance of a person. It becomes more than that. It becomes something that you draw into with a much deeper meaning than just a person. Yeah, but I, I, look, before we get to Darnell, I grew up where Nipsey Hussle's from. Nipsey Hussle is from the same set, right around the street. Got killed right around the street where I grew up. And everyone was affected to the point, same story, symbol. The community's gonna change. Everyone's gonna be givers. You know what? Guess what? Peace treaty. That is shooting at his procession. My point is, I understand where we all that's are in our healing process. But that's a community, different. that's greater I, I, than the I, 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 I'm glad you brought it up because but I want to be careful here. I live in LA and I know some Crips and Bloods. Mm. And so I want to be careful here. But I think Kobe is on top of Mount Everest. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Nipsey Hussle is at the top of Hollywood Hills. And, and I say that respectfully. I, I just think it's a different dynamic. Darnell, yeah, yeah, huge, yeah. huge Kobe fan. Yes. Uh, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I mean, obviously, first of all, tra tragedy. I mean, when I first heard the news, I mean, I was completely shocked. Still to this point, it's even hard to even believe it right now. But uh, we'd like to your point saying that you believe the Lakers are going to use this as inspiration. I completely 100 percent agree with that. And Marcel, I get what you're saying, but it's more so th the players, uh, more so uh, than just the players. It's the fans. It's the environment. Just imagine how the Stable Center is going to be the rest of this season. The, the, the type of energy that they're going to bring on. And I actually do believe that, yeah, you're, you're, you're motivated each game, but when you have something so tragic like this, someone who's been so inspirational to the, the team, the whole city, I think that does kind of, you know, add us a little bit more mm, yeah. to your everyday, your work ethic, the, the way you, you attack each play. And I mean, like you said, I mean, LeBron, man, I saw him, I saw the video, man, it was emotional, yeah. crying off the plane. I, and I, this is gonna be the little bit he needs to keep going. I, I, in football, I've always felt like the guys that come from the toughest circumstances had no problem tapping into the emotion to play football. Yeah. I used to struggle from time, because I didn't miss any meals. And we were poor, but they made sure I was fed. Right. And so, <laughs> <Alex> <laughs> and so the guys I played with that missed some meals, yeah, yeah. I, well, my best friend, only reason why we got him is because he got shot. And he had to sit out of here, he got shot. He had no problem finding the emotion to practice mm -hmm. and to play. Mm. Some, LeBron's been laying on silk sheets for a long time. Mm -hmm. He ain't gonna have no problem with emotion. All right, let's talk some Super Bowl 54, where the 49ers and the Chiefs will square off. Here in Miami on Sunday, San Francisco has ridden their dominant defense for much of the season, and the group has been stifling opponents in their two postseason games. But Patrick Mahomes and company will be their most dynamic opponent yet, with defensive coordinator Robert Salah saying the Chiefs roster looks like an Olympic relay team. And that, my friends, is why I'm confident mm. we win it. Chief, I don't <laughs> think, I think Kansas City speed is going to overwhelm the 49ers defense and neutralize it. I agree with you there. Uh, 49ers have not faced an offense like this, especially with this speed. You see them face the Saints, give up 46 points. And that's basically feed Michael Thomas up and down the field, Jerry Cook here and there. So the point is, you haven't seen this just yet. We're talking about three different players on the Chiefs with well, multiple receiving touchdowns of over 40 plus yards. No other team in the league can say that about their receiving core. So I think it's just gonna overwhelm. Overwhelm? No, I, I can't use the word overwhelm. This is the NFL. They're not going to be overwhelmed. 
problems presented? Absolutely. <laughs> They're going to present some problems for me. A lot of them. It's Monday. Hopefully nobody does something stupid during this week for the Chiefs. I, you just, I said it last week. You go back to the games against the Cardinals and the games against the Seahawks. They gave the 49er problems, and Kansas City is a much better version of those teams. I like what you're saying. I like where you're going with that. I, I'm going to go to a team as well that, that the, the uh, Kansas City Chiefs played, which was the Colts in week five. Yeah. All right, you remember that. Let's go through the score. Uh, first quarter, they scored three points. Second quarter, seven points. Third quarter, no points. Fourth quarter, they scored three points for a total of 13 points. I hate to bust your bubble. I do. I really you were do. A math major. But they were. I is was that not. What you just I, I was not. But <laughs> I will say this: 13 points in that game. All right. Here's the reason why they will not overwhelm them with their speed. A guy by the name of Quan Alexander. He's he's now back, and yeah. he's getting better, and he's getting faster every single game that passes. Greenlaw. Warner, their linebacking core has the ability to cover. Kelsey creates space for their outside guys and their speedsters to be able to do things. Sitting in that three zone coverage and being able to play the way they play up front with their front seven or eight, they will be able to blanket that defense, take those jet sweeps away. It's gonna be a game for Patrick Mahomes to have to win, but it won't be based upon them overwhelming them with speed. I, I, look, Tyreek Hill is good is going to make some plays on this secondary. I love what Richard Sherman's done this year. He's a Hall of Famer. I don't want to take any shots at him uh, before the game. But I think Tyreek Hill, Sammy Watkins, McCall Hardman, mm. I, I just think mm. it's going to be a problem He's for Rich. He's going to have to have the time to be able to deliver and the that, ball to those guys downfield. Athletic, mobile quarterback. You just pointed to one game out of 16. We can point to the other 15 games. That's one game. You don't the play Colts, your best every week. You hanging your hat on the Colts? I'm not hanging my hat you on the Colts. I'm hanging, hanging my hat on the, on the 49ers being able to execute a game plan much better than what the Colts LeBron, were able to do successfully. The towel of Richard Sherman is still lying on it's that sure field in Santa Clara. It's, it's beat for sure that enough. <laughs> All right, here's one stat. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, 7-0 and oh against top five passing defenses in his career. Never lost to never. DC's a top defense. Think that's gonna change? Joined now by Uncle Jimmy. All right, let's return to Kobe Bryant, Hello. who was among nine dead in a helicopter crash in, Los in the Los Angeles area yesterday, along with his 13-year-old daughter, Gianna. Kobe's death has shocked the entire world with tributes pouring in from fans all across the globe. Uncle Jimmy, uh, we talked earlier, you had some thoughts on uh, Kobe's passing. Look, man, honestly, there's nothing that I can say right now that hasn't been said all day. It's a tragedy, it's a great loss. And to me, I would personally just like to send my condolences out to the fans, the, the, the fans that showed up out at the Staples Center that felt the loss, didn't know what to do, and they just wanted to do something just to show some support. Look here, and they, they're feeling like, I've never met Kobe, why am I feeling like this? I understand how they feel, because almost 20 years ago to the date, January 23rd, 2000, Derek Thomas, one of the greatest chief players of all time, was involved in a car accident in which he, was, he ended up being paralyzed in that vehicle and another individual was actually killed in that Mike Tellis. accident. And Derek himself died two weeks later from that. And the city of Kansas City was devastated. You know, for those of you that don't know, let me just tell you real quick. Derek was drafted fourth in a draft in 1989. And in that draft, it had Troy Aikman, Barry Sanders, Deion Sanders, mm. as well as Derek Thomas. Mm. And let me tell y'all something. We in Kansas City would not have traded Derek Thomas for one of those Hall of Famers because he was ours and we loved him. And look here, look at me. He was a talent on the field as well as off the field, okay? Look here, and look here, I'm gonna tell you something. And once we got Carl Peterson, then we got Marty Schottenheimer, and then we got Derek Thomas, it changed the whole complexion of the city. You know, Derek Thomas became a philanthropist. He started a third and long foundation. Uh, he started mentoring the inner city youth. He just started putting back into the community that he came from, okay? He was to Carl Peterson to the, what, like what Kobe was to Jerry West, okay? So I'm just telling the fans of Los Angeles, I understand what it feels like to lose one of your own. You know okay, what? when you watch somebody on the field for all those years and you watch them give their own, 
you feel like you lost one of your own, man. Yeah. And even though you ain't never met him, you deserve that, man. So to the fans in Los Angeles, man, y'all deserve that. Handle that. Right. You know, of all the athletes that I've covered, I was closest to Derek Thomas. We were friends. We did things together. I remember that pain, and I agree with Uncle Jimmy. I know what the fans in Los Angeles are going through, the hardcore Kobe fans. Obviously, Marcel's and I yes, agreement here. Yes. Uh, Kobe, in, in, in his passing and just the way he handled it, the end of his life, a uh, hundred approval rating. I couldn't right. approve of Kobe any more than I do uh, at this moment. Thank you for joining us today on this show, on this journey.